The Florida of today is the America of tomorrow, but maybe not so much anymore. DeSantis is falling. DeSantis is. is falling. He is not a shooting star. He is very much a falling star, and he is getting desperate and flailing. And this is a guy who thinks he's like the the, the class president or the, the the jock, the quarterback. He's not even the class clown. He's like the, the creepy kid in the corner who eats his boogers, you know, like who still like shits his pants in high school. Like that's that's what's happening with this guy. And people are not buying the whole let's make America Florida. They're like, what the hell's going on in Florida? Uh, just this week, the man in a total desperate attempt to revive his dying presidential uh, aspirations, uh, he, he removed uh, Monique Worrell, the only black woman who is a uh, lead prosecutor, a state attorney in the state of Florida. This is now the second Democrat prosecutor he's removed from office in as many years. It was found unconstitutional when he did, did it the first time to Andrew Warren last year. Um, but the, the same federal judge said, but I don't really have the power to reinstate you. So, yeah, it was unconstitutional. Yeah. I can't do anything about it. And now he's done it again. And if you want to talk about big government, government overreach, the weaponization of the government look no further than the free state of Florida and Ron DeSantis, who's no better than than Fidel Castro, as it turns out. It's it's the weaponization of government is not what the DOJ or Jack Smith or uh, Alvin Bragg or Fannie Willis are doing to Donald Trump. It is what Ron DeSantis is doing here. And the hypocrisy is just it's like a it's a grotesquery at this point. Speaking of which, comedian Will Lopez is here as <laughs> guest co-host. You you ever hear of Prager U? Your your kids go to Prager University? No. Uh, I do not know anything about Prager U. Uh, that's foreign to me. Uh, and you're putting me in a weird position, man, because um, my boy Ronnie D this week. He, Ronnie D, huh? He he put eight racks in my pocket, man, with my step up for students program uh, and for someone to give me that kind of money and for me to still believe, you know, what, you know, who this guy is, you know, tells a lot about what's so going like, on so in my wonderful You're, you're state a sellout in, my... in that you'll take the money, but oh, you're not I a sellout in that you don't take a side. Right. Is what you're All right. I, I, I'm a complete sellout. I respect that. I'm the Stugats of parenting in, in, <laughs> the, United, <laughs> in the state of Florida. So, Prager U is a fake University. It's basically okay. a YouTube channel started by this conservative talk show personality, Dennis Prager, and it produces proudly, by the way, uh, indoctrination materials to uh, to poison the minds of of young people. Okay. Uh, and and because, you know, uh, they can't uh, they can't reproduce. So they have to recruit. Because kids aren't born hateful and ignorant and stupid. You have to you have to teach that and instill that uh, in our nation's youth. And that's what they proudly say their intention is. But after all these years that we've been listening to how public schools should not indoctrinate students and teachers or grooming and ideology should be taken out of the classroom. We need to just teach the facts right in, in schools. Now, the Florida Department of Education has approved for use as teaching resources. No, no. Prager U videos. OK, and I mean, you got titles like How the Left Destroyed My Country, Unwoke Inc., Andrew Jackson, The People's President, and The Inconvenient Truth About the Democratic Party. They're asking important questions, Roy, like, should T be part of LGBT? Is hate speech free speech? Would you house illegal immigrants in your home? And was Jesus a socialist? Spoiler alert. Yes, he absolutely was. So this whole Prager you it's all Bud Light, open borders, Holocaust exploitation, transgender hysteria, fossil fuel industry propaganda. Florida has decided we've heard enough from like legitimate experts and scientists and professionals and peer reviewed educational materials like Scholastic and Highlights. It's time we hear from people with absolutely no psycho. Yeah, let's from absolutely no experience or qualifications whatsoever. Um, and um, that said, I'm very excited. That Ellie Mastal is here. He is the justice correspondent at The Nation and the host of its uh, new legal podcast called Contempt of Court. Uh, he's an Alfred Nobler fellow at uh, the Tight Media Center. Uh, most importantly to me, he is the author of one of my favorite books about the law. The New York Times bestseller, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. And I'm going to allow him to retort to this Prager U video of an animated Frederick Douglass white splaining slavery and the, yes i said frederick Douglass white splaining that's a phrase in the year of our lord 2023 white splaining slavery and the constitution while throwing shade at blm children 
Our founding fathers knew that slavery was evil and wrong, and they knew that it would do terrible harm to the nation. They wanted it to end, but their first priority was getting all 13 colonies to unite as one country. The southern colonies were dependent on slave labor, and they wouldn't have joined a union that had banned it. Are you okay with that? I'm certainly not okay with slavery, but the Founding Fathers made a compromise to achieve something great, the making of the United States. It was America that began the conversation to end it. But Leo is correct that big problems need to be approached very carefully. Have you kids heard of William Lloyd Garrison? No. Nope. He's an abolitionist like me, and he and I used to be friends, but we aren't any longer. We don't agree how to solve problems. William refuses all compromises, demands immediate change, and if he doesn't get what he wants, he likes to set things on fire. Sounds, Sounds familiar. Sounds like you know the type. Yeah, we've got that type in our time. So, you're trying to work for change inside of the American system. Precisely, Layla. Our system is wonderful, and the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. We just need to convince enough Americans to be true to it. I, I don't really have much more to say about this, it sounds Ellie like a- I, I I think we just need, I mean, that was like so much runway that I don't need, I'm just going to, I'm going to push my my chair back from the table. It sounds like a Howard Stern skit. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised it didn't say Baba Booey at the end of it. It's unbelievable. <sighs> Ellie Mistal, what do you think of this PragerU lesson for the, for the youth of Florida? Hello, Billy. Hello, Will. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, so th- there's a lot I want to talk about, but we'll start with PragerU. And I have to say, guys, until I saw that video, I did not know you could do blackface through animation. <laughs> oh. But that's what that is. That is the blackface animation of Frederick Douglass. And it is, of course, disturbing. It is, of course, a lie. But you almost have to respect the chutzpah of these Prager U people to just take just take a white man, dress him in animation blackface, and then have him cosplay as Frederick Douglass. It is, it, it is, it takes a certain level of depravity, yet creativity, um, to come to that video. It's kind of amazing, right? So, I mean, look, just, it, it's embarrassing that I have to say this, but obviously everything in that video was false. Um, we can start with the falsity of Frederick Douglass being allowed to speak to white children, (laughs) all right? That's not something that happened. That's not something they let him do. Talk to white people? Are you kidding me? I mean, are you actually kidding me, right? So like, that that's like number one. And I know it seems like the smallest thing, but it's actually, but it actually goes to show just how kind of insidious that video is. That video creates the idea that there basically creates the idea that slavery was a conversation. There was back and forth. There were good people on both sides, right? And and that's just not how it happened. And the biggest lie there is 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 not even a lie. It's it's the it's 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 the acceptance of something they actually do say in the video, right? Um, uh, uh, the founding fathers wanted to end slavery, but their first priority was to get the union to unite as one country. A, the founding fathers did not want to end slavery, and we can talk about that. But B, the idea, right, that it was more important to these people to unite the country than to end slavery, even if you think that they wanted to end slavery, how depraved and messed up is that, right? Because if he had asked Frederick Douglass, if he had asked any black person at the time, they would have said, no, no, no. Ending slavery is the most important thing, not uniting the country. And we can prove that, right? Because something like 5,000 or so um, black people fought in the Revolutionary War on the sides of the Americans, right? 20 to 25,000 black people fought in the Revolutionary War on the side of the British because what they were trying to do was get free. That's how important freedom was to black people at the time of the founding, at the time of the revolution. They looked at their options 
and they were like, this British colonial empire with the mad king, better, better for me than George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and the lies and slavery they are selling. George Washington at the time of the revolution was the largest slave holder in America. That's where his wealth came from. Slave holding. All right. And so black people at the time looked at that. I'm like, mm, no, I'm trying to King George man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so like the, the entire video is obviously a lie. It's obviously meant to um, indoctrinate white children because the and you kind of again you kind of understand why slavery is horrible it's a horrible thing to have done and when white children figure out what this country is based on they're like wait that's that doesn't sound right to me and that's why more people end up being liberal than conservatives right because the only the people who end up being conservatives are the ones that was like ah, oh, yeah slavery it happened but what are you gonna do about it but once we end up being liberals we're like no that's that, that seems wrong. We should probably do something about that, maybe like now, right? And so they have to tell white kids it wasn't as bad as you think. It wasn't as bad as it sounds because if it, if you tell people what it really was, they react pretty strongly, both politically and professionally. So so that's why it's there. We know why it's there. The the the, the upshot of all of this, and you know, I'm I'm saying this based not on my kind of understanding of the history of America, but my understanding of the history of North Korea. The, the upshot <laughs> of all this is that when you try to indoctrinate a populace by telling them lies, by telling them things that are not true, by telling them ahistorical things, that only works if you can keep them within that clothed system for the rest of their lives. Right. There's a reason why North Korea shuts down the Internet. Right. There's a reason why North Korea won't let you see the Barbie movie. Right. Because they have to keep their people locked in forever. Because the minute they see what the world is really like, they react and revolt against that indoctrination and against those lies. Right. It's why it's why the East Germans had to build a wall, because once you saw You've got the Venus Schnitzel here. That's amazing, right? Once you saw what they had in West Germany, you were like, well, this East German thing, I don't think this is so great. You've got to keep people locked in, walled in, under control forever. It was the so schnitzel. it might work for the Florida schnitzel got from K through 12, but if any of these, if any of these people they're trying to indoctrinate, if any of them ever gets out, right? If any, if any of them ever goes uh, uh, escape, north- and, Escape and, the free state of Florida? Well, Right. <laughs> if, if anyone ever goes to see a, you know, I, I don't even know what it's called anymore, a big twenty-five football game in Michigan. Big twenty-five. Right? <laughs> anybody, yeah. If anybody, if anybody, if anybody gets on a riverboat in Montgomery, right, at, right, for freedom at, on a on a freedom ship, they're going to well, learn some new stuff, and they're going to be <laughs> angry. At the people who lied to them and indoctrinated them in the past. The other thing about this video, I wish we had a still photo of this. Uh, you mentioned blackface about it. Uh, it was clearly drawn by white animators because that did not even look like Frederick Douglass. <laughs> that looked like James Brown with bad chin hair. Right. But the kids look like Taylor Swift fans. They look. Oh, great. they absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's. It's amazing that they think that this is going to work. But like, I mean, look, I have kids. Kids are dumb. They'll, they'll, <laughs> like, they'll believe what you put in their face right like the, for for, oh. for a bit eventually they become teenagers and they start you know and it's going to be amazing right when these when these kids who were indoctrinated this way and start rejecting because, yeah start rejecting right? everything that they've been taught absolutely because knowledge to them is going to be like the new drug right mm. yo 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 you want a book you want a book yo i got <laughs> books I got books, yo. <laughs> yes, the Florida me... the Florida book black market. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna we're start running here. I, I, I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. When I was a kid, I was raised to believe you know everything was rosy and okay. Like I just saw the movie Oppenheimer. I was told, yeah, we dropped a couple of bombs to end the war. It wasn't a big deal. When what you know? And then you see the movie, see what we did. What we did? What? Huh? Like huh? And you know you of course kids are gonna get fooled it's easy 
I fool my kids every day. I lie to my kids every day. <laughs> and they believe me. And they're so, in college And now, they're in they? college now, yeah. <laughs> uh, LA, like, well, but, uh, but I, Will, I, I'll say this, and, and, and Roy, back me up here uh, 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 if you think I'm right. But when I was a kid, I was also raised to believe that everything was rosy and okay by the schools. <laughs> yep. But it was coming home to the parents, coming home to the aunties and uncles, coming home to the community that – taught me black history. My parents did not rely on the school. And I grew up in liberal ass New York. My parents did not rely on the liberal white school system to teach me a damn thing about black history or the history of this country, right? They knew that I wasn't going to get the real truth from the schools. So there's a whole home educational, you know, project. And this is what, what I've saved, what I've said generally about Florida schools, like all that, all that's happening is that kind of white people in Florida are realizing they're going to have to behave more like black parents have behaved for the past 200 years. Well, in my case, which means you educate your own because you know that the public school system isn't going to do the job. In my case, I was raised Cuban. So in a Cuban household, you got to understand same thing. No Internet where they were from. They, you know, they came over. They got here for freedom. So f growing up for me was shut up and dribble, shut up and learn. Just shut up and listen <laughs> to your teacher. And that's it. Because, you know, what do you want to go back to Cuba? You want to go back to what we had. So to me, it was OK. This is what freedom looks like. This is what beauty looks like this is what a wonderful world looks like and we didn't question it we just went along with it a, a lot of people always ask me billy why do you like anything you 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 hate everything well i love ellie mistal and i love his book allow me to retort a black guy's guide to the constitution and if you want to be smarter you will read this book if you want to learn something about our founding fathers, about the founding document that still runs this country today. And it's just and it's fundamental inequities and dysfunction. You have to read this book. And it is so funny and so entertaining, as is Ellie Mistal. Ellie, thank you so much for being here again. Thanks for having me. Will, you, you may remember earlier this year when um, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and uh, the Department of Education basically canceled the AP Black History class. Yes. Um, because it was, I don't know, uh, too Jewish, maybe. I'm not exactly sure uh, what the complaint was. But last week, the College Board, uh, which is the nonprofit education organization um, that administers AP advanced placement uh, courses and the SAT, announced that the Florida Education Department, quote, effectively banned AP psychology in the state by instructing Florida superintendents that teaching foundational content on sexual orientation and gender identity is illegal under state law, end quote, because of the, the so-called don't say gay law. Uh, and then the state seemed to reverse course, announcing that that you could teach it, uh, uh, quote, in its entirety in a manner that is age and developmentally appropriate in order to comply with the law. But now at least a half a dozen school districts and counting across the state have said that they will not in fact, offer the course. Um, the public school district in, in one of those counties, Brevard, said outright uh, that it was abiding by the Education Department's initial guidance of last week, saying in a statement, quote, in essence, if we teach all the content, our students will not receive AP. I'm sorry. Quote, in essence, if we don't teach all the content, our students will not receive AP credit. If we do teach all the content, our instructors will violate the law. Therefore, we will not offer AP psychology at any of our high schools this year. And this is repeating all over the state, which, of course, was the intent of the law to create confusion and fear and dissent. Uh, Rachel Chapman is an award winning 17 year veteran psychology teacher at Freedom High School, appropriately named Freedom High School uh, in Orlando, Florida and Central Florida. She teaches AP psych in Orange County, which is the eighth uh, largest school district in the entire country and the fourth largest in the state of Florida. Rachel, are you afraid of of the legal ramifications if you teach this class that you've taught for nearly two decades? Are you risking your career? Are you risking your freedom? Could you be arrested in the free state of Florida for teaching AP psychology? Currently, yes. The way that the law is stated, it talks about age developmentally appropriate, but that's not defined. So if we cover that content, then we could be arrested. We could lose our teaching certification, which would mean we wouldn't be able to teach anymore in the state of Florida. Hey, Billy, why didn't you do your homework? Oh, well, I don't want my teacher to go to jail. I'm, what do you, I mean, I, this is uh, so absurd. Are, so, are, are your, were your kids product of the Florida public school system? Uh, yes, they were. Crop. 
So I, as as I was, I'm a functioning illiterate. I, I hope that they were. I hope they received a, a better education. Than I'm actually kidding. The Miami Dade Pol- County Public Schools were actually pretty fantastic when I was a kid. But that also was like what thirty years ago. For crying out loud! I mean, this is absolute utter insanity. Let me ask you this, Rachel: What? Why does sexual orientation and gender identity have to be included in an AP psychology course? When we look at psychology in general, we look at the study of psychology, it covers a broad range of topics. And AP psychology is what is known as a survey course. So the entire course has um, little bits and pieces of all of psychology in order for the students to get a well-rounded viewpoint of what psychology is in totem. If we start taking out bits and pieces, then it's not psychology anymore. And a huge part of human development is identity, not just identity of your culture, not just identity of your age group, not just identity of the country you live in or the language you speak, but also the identity you have in regards to your personal gender and sexuality. So it ceases to be the subject that you're supposed to be teaching. I mean, you can't just go in and kind of, well, the governor can't have a line item veto on the curriculum because then it ceases to be uh, the curriculum. Um, Florida is experiencing, as we're about to embark upon a new school year, uh, its worst teacher shortage in history, one of the worst, if not the worst 6, in the 000? entire country. I believe it's now the Florida Education Association estimates 8,000 teachers short as of right now. And then they estimate another 6,000 vacancies for support staff. Some districts like Monroe County down in the in uh, in the Keys are forced to use virtual learning again, going back to no, the no, pandemic no, days, no, no. to ease the, the shortage because teachers are quitting, they are retiring, they are resigning, and it doesn't strike me as a lot of people are running to be hired and fill in these positions. Rachel, what is the impact that this is having uh, or that you're experiencing, I don't know, if your school and your district from colleagues and for your students? It's very difficult. There are kids who went to open house who didn't have a teacher to go and meet. There are students who have holes in their schedules because we don't have enough teachers to fill in those those positions. We have um, schools where they'll be relying on substitutes, if we can even get substitutes, mm-hmm. to fill in those positions until they can find somebody. So the, the shortage is real. It's a big deal. And students are the ones who are going to be hurt by it because they're not going to be getting the education that they deserve from the very beginning of the school school year. Why, in your opinion, is this happening? It's very complicated. There's a couple different levels. In Florida, there is a compensation issue Mm. where our our compensation has kind of been compressed because we had laws saying we need to increase the starting salary, but that didn't increase veteran salary. So there's a lot of veterans making really close to what brand new teachers are making. And so that dissuaded a lot of people Mm. from staying in when they could have stayed in for longer. And if I'm not mistaken, Um, Florida still ranks 48th in teacher pay in the United States. Yes, it's very low. And you, as you know, Florida is one of the, the the states where we're being hit the hardest by inflation. Mm. So that further compresses our salary and makes it so it can't go very far. Another issue, of course, is the current climate and culture, where there's a lot of demonization of educators. We're, we're called names and on the internet. Some people have been calling educators as a whole groomers. And I know a lot of educators where they just don't want to deal with that anymore. And so they're leaving the profession. My son, uh, during COVID, uh, would those virtual doesn't work, man. I would walk into his bedroom and there'd be two TV screens up. On the right would be his Zoom class, and on the left was Call of Duty. And he'd be under the desk, like low key playing. And and I'd be like, Lorenzo, what are you doing? And he's like, Dad, the entire class is in the game with me. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, uh, Call of Duty is, is also not an inaccurate depiction of the public schools uh, in, in this country uh, today either. Uh, R- Rachel, you were speaking, of course, of the students. Reason for the season, right? That's why yes. you do what it is that you do. You are, you are there uh, for them. And I know that and you know this. Well, I mean, you're, you know, the staff at schools, the teachers at schools, they spend more time with your kids in these years than even you do. Uh, and and the government has not only censored the curriculum, but the kinds of conversations you can have one-on-one with these students. You are, a, I mean, this is just basic empathy, human interaction, the kind of guidance that that 
children need, not even children, teenagers that people need when they're developing and at this age and they have questions, questions that even if they spend more time with their parents, they might be too scared to engage with. What are What is the feedback you're getting from some of your students about this moment in culture about the idea that that here they are on the eve of, you know, perhaps their senior year, their junior year, they're getting ready for for, you know, to start preparing for for college admissions. They need these AP credits and courses. What is what is how are they feeling? What are they saying to you if if you're allowed to have conversations with them? Um, a lot of them are afraid. We had, um, I, I was able to speak to a bunch of former students and some of them still at the school, some of them not at the school. And the ones who are still at the school are very concerned because they mm-hmm. want to have the best opportunity to get into a good college. They want to have the same opportunities as kids from any other state. And they are concerned that this is putting them at a disadvantage, that any other school is going to be looking at Florida schools not as highly as maybe some other schools from other states where they haven't had these sort of restrictions. And these conversations are so important to have with the kids. Like you said, sometimes they're not comfortable talking with their parents, but sometimes they do become comfortable because they were able to talk about about it with a teacher first. And in, so by limiting teachers, you're also gonna be limiting conversations that they have at home with their families because sometimes they just need to run something by an adult that they know is gonna care about them before they go to their own parents. Are the students talking to you at all about this moment in history, about the governor, about what the government's doing to the quality of their education and therefore the value of their diplomas, their reputation nationally when it comes to consideration for college? Are, are, are they, is it, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, radicalizing them or, or politicizing uh, them? There, I, I can say that there are a lot of students who have recently in the past month gone and registered or pre-registered to vote who hadn't been interested in it before. Huh. Um, so it is kind of triggering a response in a lot of students that maybe they weren't so interested in politics before, but they suddenly are right now. They're suddenly seeing how it might affect them. Rachel Chapman, 17-year veteran, public school teacher, the toughest job in the toughest place in the toughest time. Thank you for being Thank here. You for Thank you service. so much for your, for, for your service. Welcome to our segment, Fear and Florida Men on the Campaign Trail. I was right in the middle of a f-ing reptile zoo. And somebody was giving booze to these goddamn things. Joining us to talk about Fear and Florida Men on the Campaign Trail is longtime Metro columnist for the Orlando Sentinel, Scott Maxwell. You know, Scott, we've been talking about how the the theory of the Florida of today is the America of tomorrow seems to be kind of sinking along with the the fortunes of uh one uh, Ronald Elizabeth DeSantis in the uh, in his uh, in his in, in his and uh, really his his wife Tacchio's hopes that someday he is going to be uh, president of the whole wide world. And uh, please clap. But uh, the idea that, of course, that Florida has been for the last two plus decades, really just a beta testing ground for the worst right. fucking laws and ideas. Flor- uh, Florida's Black Widow Marion Hammer, who spent 44 years as a lobbyist for the NRA and served as the first woman of that uh, national gun cult uh, and has helped make the United States the mass shooting capital of the world and made firearms the number one cause of death for American children more than car crashes and cancer. Of course, in 2005, she wrote by her own hand the shoot your neighbor, a.k.a. stand your ground law that was then exported to other, you know, beta tested here and then and then exported to other uh, legislatures across the country. Um, and that really was, you know, and, and, and blood, blood on the hands of Marion Hammer and Jeb Bush and the NRA and all of the complicit cowards and death cultists of the Republican Party who allowed, uh, you know, for basically a gun industry organization to to create uh, you're masquerading as a civil rights organization, I should say, to murder people uh, for profit, and it's getting worse. More Americans die of gun-related injuries in 2021 than any other year on record. I'm going totally off on a tangent here, yeah, but my point right. is that Florida keeps screwing this country up, and it, and Ron DeSantis was not having a very good week. All the news was bad. Down was going Casey's dreams of running for governor herself and all of this, you know, being the Republican Hillary Clinton and all this stuff. And then he tried to change the conversation with a little bit of fascism. Scott, what the hell's going on here? 
Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Florida has exported. If it was crappy, Florida has exported it. It's not just stand your ground. It's don't say gay. There's a there's a bunch of other things. But all of a sudden we have Ron DeSantis, whose campaign has had more resets than a busted iPhone. And you keep having his problem saying, well, maybe it's not this staff. We need to get this chief of staff. I feel like like this is the marketing team for like anchovy bubble gum. At some point in time, they have to realize it's not the staff. It's not the billboards. It's the product you're trying to peddle. And for the first time, really in a long time, America is looking at Florida and saying, what the hell is wrong with you all? Why are you so obsessed with drag queens and slavery? And we're and we're like a laughing stock at this point. We got this 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 nose picker from Dunedin who's in his high heel boots running around in pumps. And but I'm like, it's just, you know, literally like picking his nose and eating it on live TV. And man can't even laugh like a human. I think Chris Christie's going to dismantle him uh, in this debate. If, if Donald and if Donald Trump's there, they're both going to going to dismantle him. I mean, this is an embarrassment at this point, right? Yeah, no, everything that's happened has, has uh, what's the word for not exceeded, uh, gone beneath expectations uh, for Ron DeSantis. And, and what's remarkable, to your point, you know, a lot of liberals get driven crazy by Ron DeSantis. And I have to remind them that we're still in a state that, for the most part, really likes him. Uh, I mean, he just won by 20 points, da- damn near. And that's the largest margin in mo- modern history in Florida. But what we are seeing increasingly is that Florida is not like the rest of America and the rest of America. And we're talking about Republicans, mind you. These aren't sure. these aren't general polls. He's doing crappy. And these are Republican polls. They are saying we don't understand why you are so obs- obsessed with transgender people, for instance, and this book banning stuff. I think most normal people from both parties aren't excited about that. So he keeps resetting and keeps resetting. This week, he decided to target a a prosecutor in our neck of the woods, I think, to maybe shift it to law and order because anti-woke is getting him about 5% in some of the polls in New Hampshire. (laughs) So this is an act of desperation. He's just thirsty to try to change the conversation. All the press has been negative for really not just this week, but for months on end about this campaign. Right. It was like reset, reset. He finally did like a hard reset replaced his campaign manager for crying out loud with a man with zero zero national campaign uh experience his his chief of staff from here in the state of florida the guy who basically all the shitty ideas and the florida fuckery that we're exporting has come from basically this guy who's now running the campaign but i think you're right ultimately the product itself the candidate himself sucks but talk to me about the reaction this week to uh Monique Worrell, a woman who was elected with what, nearly 67 percent of the vote. Let's talk about this anti-democratic governor. Let's talk about what 60 percent of Central Floridians voted for rent stabilization. You had 60 plus percent of key uh, of 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 conch uh, Republic folks in Key West vote against cruise ships. And then the Florida Republican supermajority legislature overturning democracy. And once again, we have a an authoritarian, a wannabe tin pot dictator removing a woman for the second year in a row, removing a democratically elected in a free and fair election prosecutor from office. Desperate. No. And, and if you think about I always ask people, pretend you're not Florida for a minute. You know, we're, we oh. know we're a banana republic. But pretend you're reading about a third world and you read about some dictator hmm. who who decided that uh, a local mayor or governor was elected. And that dictator just decided, you know what? I don't like that person who was elected hmm. by the people who live in that town. And they decided to remove him for office. I think most Floridians, most Americans would consider that nuts. Uh, but I got to tell you, we've been doing it a lot more in this state. And uh, and I've uh, historically taken a stance against it, even when it was unpopular in your neck of the woods uh, down in South Florida. I don't think the sheriff down there, Scott Israel, was a great guy. I don't think the election supervisor, Brenda Snipes, was a terribly competent election supervisor. But the way to get them out of office is democracy. You wait till the next cycle and you let people vote. You don't let, you know, dictators or authoritarians uh, remove them. And right now there's nothing criminal charged about Monique Worrell. Right. But, but speaking of criminal, if you want to draw a comparison, I think you're, Billy, you're somewhat familiar with another politician from our neck of the woods, Joel Greenberg. This <laughs> was uh, Matt Gates's buddy, our tax collector. We wrote story after story about malfeasance and inappropriate things. Ron DeSantis left this guy in office. He didn't get kicked out of office by any state officials. It wasn't until the feds came in with uh, wire fraud, stalking, sex trafficking charges. Ron DeSantis was okay with that 
elected official being in office. But this prosecutor, I, I think there's some there's going to be a, a a distinction there that's going to have a tough time selling on most. Crypto fascists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Scott, you know, we have a, a, a an elected official down here, a city commissioner, Joe Carollo. He's a registered Republican, but he uh, it, it isn't a nonpartisan, you know, local uh, commissioner. And this guy was convicted by a federal civil jury, mind you, of violating the constitutional rights of constituents, weaponizing city government, the police department, code enforcement to attack a political rival. Sixty seven million dollars was the judgment against him. Uh, And it was unequivocally found that he violated the United States Constitution. He violated his oath of office. He violated the state constitution. People beseeched Governor Ron DeSantis just a couple months ago to remove this guy from office. This was a bipartisan in effort, mind you. I've never seen more unanimity in Miami Day between Republicans and Democrats than on the issue of getting Joe Carollo out of office. And the, the feedback from the governor's office was, well, he hasn't been charged criminally yet. And I wondered, well, Andrew Warren, the state attorney in Hillsborough and Tampa uh, area was not charged criminally. And he was a duly elected and removed from office by the governor. Monique Worrell, was duly elected and she is not, as you just said, not been charged criminally. So what is actually, in your opinion, the standard here? What is actually the criteria for Ron? And and this is where you and I are engaging on a fool's errand (laughs) because we are trying to apply some sense of logic or consistency where there is not one other than part other than the obvious one, which is sort of a partisan ideology. There's another South Florida example, the sheriff who replaced uh, Scott Israel. He was found to have, I think I've got this right, lied on his application. Yes. Uh, and and there were a lot of people who said, well, you can't keep a law enforcement guy in office. He's still there. Last I checked. Yeah, there are no consistent standards. This seems to be a way to try to grasp at straws when at virtually everything he He's done uh, has failed the the slavery, the Prager. You, I don't know if you guys have watched any of these bananas videos. They're kind of like if Schoolhouse Rock had a baby with David Duke. We just I mean, talked about. <laughs> We have like cartoon version of Christopher Columbus telling kids like their main main lesson about slavery is I'm writing this down. Quote: Being taken as a slave is better than being killed. Right. What? That, that's that's the lesson we want. School children in the floor. None of this stuff is playing well, not among black conservatives, not among anybody. Uh, so now we're shifting to woke prosecutors. I guess. But what Ron is trying to do is is trying to find his Mexican wall moment. He's trying to find something that because he's winning here. So the nonsense, the stuff he does, don't say gay, the trans stuff. He wins here. It, yeah. So he's thinking to himself, wait a minute. So this has got to work nationwide, too. So he's trying to find his get rid of the Mexicans moment. His one thing that will connect with that base that will get behind. Him. It's not working. I'm I not think you are working. absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They are genuinely flummoxed. Every sort of xenophobic crap they have. They're flung going for all of it, man. Let's has, go. Has, has, yeah, it's gone over gangbusters in Florida. And they're sort of perplexed why people in Idaho and New Hampshire and Iowa <laughs> aren't buying it. Uh, hook, line and sinker. It's I think because it's desperate. It's thirsty and it's weak. That's the thing. It's weak. OK, this guy is so de- he like he's just they're gazing, gazing at the White House saying, I want all of that. But. That's that's why. And 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 it's 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 clear right now, the Republican Party for what it is. They just want a strong man. Right. Right. That's what they want. They want an authoritarian, not like a make believe one. He's like the Disney World authoritarian. Right. You go. Who does he go? He punches down at at women and people of color and immigrants and Disney World, but he, which everybody loves. He's got to be telling himself, though, it worked for Trump. Why isn't it working for me? Cause Trump, Yeah, because Trump is still there. You can't out Trump Trump. So he, his only chance, I think originally, Team DeSantis was like, OK, there's a good chance he's going to get locked up or get uh, <laughs> you know convicted. And then Trump's like, I don't care. I'm still <laughs> running for president. <laughs> and By I the think way, that's what DeSantis I, sort of like had a meltdown. They're like, oh, my God, he is going to run for president and he might win the primary. Mary. Right. I think Trump is Cuban, by the way. <laughs> why, <laughs> why, do you, Dude, why do you think that? He he uh, paid a prostitute to not tell, find, so his wife wouldn't find out that he was cheating on her. He got arrested for that. He got arrested for stealing shit from work and taking it back. I'm telling you, he lives in Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump is Cuban. I, I just have two things to say about that. Comunista! And, Comunista! Yeah. Uh, Scott Maxwell. You got to read him, the Orlando Sentinel, 
Um, fantastic stuff. Really just like at this point, you're just like it's it's like a, a wildlife documentary covering. It's like Nat, Nat Geo at this point. You just like you need an, an Australian accent and just talk about like just the absolute backwards and craziness of. I just wish some of the breeds I covered were going extinct. But yes, <laughs> I, I, Magatov. You're Magatov. goddamn right, Meatball. Comedian Will Lopez. Bay Club Comedy at Lucali Pizza in South Beach every other every Monday. other Monday. Great yep. comedy. In the before times when I got out to more comedy. Longest running great. comedy show in Miami. Get out of here. Are you serious? Absolutely. How long? It's been six years. Six and a half wow. years. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Not, you know, not counting the improvs, which is, you know, part of the reason why this is such an incredible comedy town. So many great people have come out of here. And not so, counting COVID. Not counting COVID. Right. We yeah. were closed for COVID for a little while. Well, Thank you survived you a pandemic, though. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. Sure. Um, Because I used to get out a lot in the before times, pre-pandemic, and that was one of my favorite local comedy shows. It's just like a fun Dude, we get great. uh, uh, Rachel Wolfson was on it. You know, people that you've had on the show as your guest comics have all, you know, appeared through Neary, Brittany. You know, we've got uh, Marcelo Hernandez was now on SNL. Used to do our show. hilarious. Yeah. Monday nights can be challenging. But it gets packed. Yes. And it gets fun. It's not one of those like weird comedy nights when you're like sitting in a place, minding your own business, having a drink, and all of a sudden there's like a pop up comedy night that annoys people. Like right. people are into it. People not, love it. it. To me, it's like the closest Miami comes to the cellar in New York because yeah. people come there to work out stuff. It's uh, very intimate, very small, you know, 30 people, it's packed. And you know it's it's just phenomenal, and it's and it's a free show. The the pizza is incredible, and it's just um, I'm glad that we get to put together a really good show for people on a Monday, which is amazing. Yeah. So and strike that that great balance of just like local talent, you know, cultivating sure. local talent, and then you get names, and I'm like, Absolutely. oh shit, he's got a national touring yeah. act. I'm uh, in, I'm in. Yeah, we've had a lot of great national people come through. Absolutely. At will the MIA. Uh, or at uh, Stardust uh, One official O N E official for for his band, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Thank you for for being on and guest Absolutely. hosting the podcast. Well, you me. and I have a history. I mean, there was um, sorted our br- our brief but bitter affair. Or? <laughs> Absolutely, oh, yeah. you were a guest on my podcast. Um, I don't remember this. It was at Winwood Radio. It was during Art Basel. I know Winwood Radio, like six years ago. For uh, United or uh, um, Untitled was the name of the event, and an amazing. The thing event happened. was called Untitled. I'm yeah. supposed to remember this anyway. It's you called were, Untitled. It, you were going to be Wait, like, where were we? Uh, in uh, on South Beach in the big white tent. You were my guest, right? And I called Winwood Radio, told me hey, I'm bringing uh, Billy Corbin, and he's going to be my guest. And and one of the interns texted me on the side and said, "Look, man, I'm I'm a really big fan." Is it okay if if I take his lanyard and and I make something on it and you know present it to him and I'm like okay cool I'm like maybe she went to the U maybe she's a big cocaine cowboy fan I don't know so we're we get big to cocaine the, fan <laughs> or big cocaine from Miami we get to the front door and you walk in and she's looking at me and she's looking at you and she's looking at me and she's completely like has this weird confused face on him like what's wrong and then she showed me the lanyard that she wanted to present to you. It was Billy Corgan from the Smashing <laughs> yes. Pumpkins. It was. And the, the best part of it was you and your reaction because you were so great about it. You were so gracious. You just, <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> we walked away and you just under your breath looked at me and said, not the first time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the one with the hair. That's the, that's the difference. And I got to tell you, so, so Billy Corgan got at Billy on Twitter. Sure. And I guess, I don't know if he was an early adopter or an investor or what <laughs> happened, but like he got at Billy. And, but here's the thing. When you want to tweet at Billy Corgan, people go at B-I-L-L-Y-C-O-R. And, and then, my, no, but my name comes all, up first. at Billy is him. You have to stop there. So if you keep going, you get me. I would <laughs> autofill back in the day, uh, pre-blue. But like, and then, so I would get all the... Some of them are very nice, but some of them on Sunday after wrestling or something, he had something to do with some wrestling league. Sure. And after that, people would be like on Sunday, they're like at Billy Corbin, like, like, stop, stop messing with Daisy. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Apparently it was like some like wrestling thing that was happening on Sunday nights and they would get, they would give me shit for Billy Corgan giving shit uh, to Daisy. But I have like in my phone, you'll see, I have a whole arsenal of like Billy Corgan gifs oh, that God. I reply to people on Twitter who think that it's you. that it's that it's me. So uh, that would be total nonstop action. That's uh, TNA. TNA. 
Are, are we allowed to say that on, on the program? It's an okay. acronym for Total Nonstop Stop. Action. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Don't say TNA. Is that the uh, the, the law here in uh, Don't say TNA. TNA. State of Florida? So Total Nonstop Action. So, Will, you are not just a stand-up comedian. Mm, no, I am not. Uh, you diversified. I diversified. You're, I bowl as well. No, you're, an, uh, you're an AP psychology teacher. I'm an AP psychology Out of work. Out of AP, work, yeah. right. Um, I'm a musician. I'm proud to say that I've been a musician my entire life. That's what, that's where really my heart and my soul is. And that's what, um, uh, I started comedy after my band broke up and then, um, COVID hit. And that's when I started playing music again. What's the name of your band? Stardust One. Stardust One is the, uh, is the capsule that uh, Major Nelson was in in I Dream of Jeannie when he came down and landed on the island. So, and, and that's what we're kind of doing. We're playing like, um, old school rock, like 90s alternative rock, and like imagine getting in a time machine and going back in time and playing that kind of music with today's technology, like recording in studios and, and, and production houses that, you know, can make something sound really big and great. And it's, it's been a lot of fun. It reminds me of the time that where, where, where I decided to, that I was going to write a play and I was like, well... You know, the money's not in documentary filmmaking. The real money's in the theater, right? right? And so you decide, like, the real money isn't in stand-up comedy. The real money is in the I was the lead singer of Wajito. I was, I was playing, t touring around Latin America, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, playing in front of 20,000 people in Mexico. Then, you know, hey, now I'm doing this. Thanks, Napster. So I <laughs> <laughs> had to... Napster. <laughs> wow. Right. So I took up stand-up comedy because, you know, I needed some sort of creative outlet. And that was going gangbusters. And then COVID hit. And, right. um I realized and woke up and said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and me and the rest of the guys in this band quarantined ourselves at the Gibson showroom and started writing and wrote a record. And now I'm a musician again. And it's awesome. We're signed to Intercat Records. It's a That's an awesome. independent um, distributor here in Miami. They pay for all the videos and recording. And it's uh, really having the time of my life. Where's the Gibson showroom? Gibson showroom's in Winwood. It's like right on off 20, it's off, right off Miami Avenue, off Miami Avenue. It's nice. A, How's that space? It's an incredible space, and um, it's. I want to send my condolences to the entire Levitard family, and um, because that place was really special, to David. It's all of his artwork was in there, and we were, we wrote our entire album surrounded by Lebo artwork, and you know, so um, yeah, so it's a really amazing and incredible and karmically perfect location. That was very nice. <laughs> that was very nice. It's hard, hard, hard to hard to recover from that. I had to end the show last week with you know the brief kind of eulogy uh, for Lebo, and because I, I was kind of after that, I was sort of done. It's 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 emotionally taxing, and and for everybody uh, for everybody here, uh, obviously, um, that was very nice. And I and I talked about like how artists fill emptiness right sure. like it's in there's silence and you fill it with music there's an empty wall or a canvas and you fill it yeah. with art or life or color yeah. or you know but it's a very much a part of yourself so like right. and everything that inspires you winds up on that recording or on that can did 100%. it inspire you did Lebo inspire you? oh absolutely big bang boom was a, a big thing that was behind the drums and yeah so i was staring at that as i was you know helping write um, all the songs on this record and you know and i and doing comedy too and it, it inspires that as well like i love the fact that i can do i, I just love being creative i love I'm, I'm probably the only human being on this planet that can claim to have opened up for the ramones and andrew schultz <laughs> like it's it's a <laughs> it's a I, mic drop yeah well yeah it's kind of it but it is um something that i'm proud of and something that you know i'm gonna do for the rest of my life it's just a um happy to be called a creative and it's something and happy to be called a creative from miami because this city inspires and the city's uh, an amazing place to be thank you for being here will lopez here is a music video from will's band stardust one for the song someday soon written in the gibson showroom in miami's winwood surrounded as we are here by lee Lozan. Hanging in your 
everything I do.